Hi guys, it's me, Professor Dean, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, we're going to be going over infection control, and this is going to be part one of a multi-part series. Now, before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video. Give it a thumbs up now. You're going to love the video. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already, and be sure to go to my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com, and check out all the resources available. There are audio lessons available. You can sign up for a one-on-one -on -one tutoring session session, a consultation session, or a next generation NCLEX review. Don't forget, almost daily, you can find me covering a variety of nursing topics across my social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. So be sure to check me out there. All right, guys, so let's get started. Let's take a look. We're going to start where it says scientific knowledge base, nature of infection. So it says that infection is invasion of a susceptible host, human being, by pathogens or microorganisms. So it could be, you know, bacteria, it could be a virus, it could be a fungus, right? It, any pathogen that ends up causing disease. Now, if you scroll down, take a look down here, look at what it says. It says, if the pathogens multiply and cause clinical signs and symptoms, the infection is symptomatic. Let's stop right there. If the pathogens multiply and cause clinical signs and symptoms, then that infection is called symptomatic because the patient is exhibiting symptoms. They're exhibiting symptoms such as what? We may see WBCs increase. We may see redness. We may see pain at the wound. Patient may have pain at the wound site. Patient may have inflammation at the wound site. Patient may have mucopurulent drainage. Patient may have foul odor. Any of those signs and symptoms of infection. Patients exhibiting that, then the patient is symptomatic. Let's keep going. If clinical signs and symptoms are not present, the illness is asymptomatic. Whenever you see an A in front of the word A, it means without, so without symptoms, okay? Let's take a look at the chain of infection. And look, you know this is important for you to know because I wrote right here, no, and I put three exclamation marks. When I put three exclamation marks, you know it's serious. You guys have to know this. If you're in fundamentals of nursing or foundations of nursing and you're studying this not, right now, I'm telling you, this is gonna be somewhere on your exam. Make sure you know it. So chain of infection. The presence of pathogens, those are the microorganisms, the presence of pathogens does not mean that an infection will occur. Infection occurs in a cycle that depends on the presence of all the following elements. So you have to have all of this. Look at the list. You got to have an infectious agent or a pathogen. That would be your bacteria or your fat or um, your fungus or your virus or whatever that microorganism is. Okay. So you have to have an infectious agent. You have to have a reservoir or source for pathogen growth, such as, you know, uh, water that's not moving. That's a great source for pathogen growth. We'll talk about that in a second. You have to have a port of exit from the reservoir. You have to have a mode of transmission. Then you have to have an actual entry into the host and, you know, this host has to be susceptible. Now, let's start with infectious agent, okay? All of these that I told you, you absolutely need to know, we're gonna go over them in detail and we're gonna start with the first one, which is infectious agent or pathogens. And right here, it says microorganisms include bacteria, virus. I'm not sure, <laughs> guys, forgive me. Listen, if you are new to my channel, I'll tell you now, I have a speech impediment. I was born with it. It's not going away. So please forgive me. I can spell it. I can write it, but I'm not good at pronunciation. And I do this. I kid you not. Every time I see this word, I always ask and I always forget. Fungi or fungi? How do you pronounce it? Somebody tell me in the comment section and spell it like I would say it. Thank you. Anyway, and protozoa. So those are examples of infectious agents. Now, Let's take a look over here. We're going to go over this um, chain of infection in a minute. I want to continue, but I highlighted this because it's important for you to know, and on lots of nursing exams, what the instructor will do is provide the same um, illustration, except these will be blocked out and you have to actually fill them in. So I want you to pay attention. Look how this chain of infection, right, is the same thing as this chain of infection, right, which is the same thing as 
this, what we're talking about in detail. Why am I saying that to you? Because as a student, when you're studying, you need to pay attention and pick up on these tiny subtle clues. The test writer is talking about the same thing, but presenting this information already. And we're on the first page in three different ways. In three different ways, they're talking about the same thing. Why? That's how important it is for you to know. You're going to see this on the test. Don't say I didn't warn you. Anyway, so let's keep talk. Let's keep going. We're talking about infectious agents. We're right here. It says resident skin microorganisms are not virulent. However, these skin microorganisms can cause serious infection when surgery or other invasive procedures allow them to enter deep tissue or when a patient is severely immunocompromised, which means they have an impaired immune system. If you look on the side, I wrote staff, and I'm going to give you, that's a perfect example. If you get a test question on this, usually staff is the one that they use. So I'm going to explain this to you. Um, on your skin, you walk around with staff on your skin all the time, all the time. And it doesn't make you sick. Now that same staff that you're walking around, that doesn't make you sick because your skin is intact, right? If you get a deep wound, you get a cut, that same staff that was sitting on your skin is now inside of the tissue that can cause infection. If you have an invasive um, procedure where that staff can enter your body, that can cause an infection. And of course, right here, they talk about if you're immunocompromised, that absolutely can cause an infection. And it's important for you to know the classic types of patients who are immunocompromised. Anybody with HIV or AIDS, anyone who's an organ transplant recipient because they're taking high dose steroids. Anyone taking high dose steroids for that matter, because remember steroids um, decrease inflammation, they mask the signs and symptoms of infection. Anyone who's getting um, radiation, taking chemotherapeutic agents, anyone with an autoimmune disorder, right? So anyone who's immunocompromised is on that list. Let's keep going. If the hands are visibly soiled with proteinaceous material or care is being provided to a patient with a C. diff, washing with soap and water is the preferred practice, number one. And I put HESI there because, oh my goodness, this has been seen on HESI since at least 2015, as far back as I can remember. And it has a change and you need to know this. Hand hygiene is the most effective way to break the chain of infection. It's always hand hygiene. Hand hygiene is the number one way to stop the transmission of infection. Number one, it's always going to be washing the hands with soap and water. All right, so we talked about the infectious agent itself. Let's talk about the reservoir. The reservoir is where these pathogens actually survive and even multiply. So let's take a look at what it says. It says a reservoir is a place where microorganisms survive, multiply, and away transfer to a susceptible host. Remember the susceptible host, they have to be susceptible. They have to be either immunocompromised or you know, there's been a decrease in the skin integrity. There, there's somewhere that, where that infectious agent can go into the patient's body. Common reservoirs are humans and animals, insects, food, water, organic matter, or inanimate surfaces known as fomites. Frequent reservoir for health-associated infections include, you guys got to know this, healthcare workers, especially their hands, patients, equipment, and the environment. And that's why it's so important to wash your hands. That's, so, that's why it's so important to sanitize equipment. You finish taking the patient's blood pressure, or you check their apical pulse, you wipe down your equipment with... Um, um, a wipe that has been approved, you know, by the facility, but you need to clean the equipment as well. Animals, food, water, insects, and inanimate objects can also be reservoirs for infectious organisms. Remember, the reservoir is where they grow and they multiply. This is this is where. Um, let's just keep it a grow and multiply. I'll see what I was going to say to you later. So to thrive, um, to th to thrive, organisms require a proper environment, including appropriate food, oxygen, water, temperature, pH, and light. I don't know why I didn't highlight this in a different color, but I should have. This is very important for you guys to know. In order for those um, um, infectious agents to thrive, this is what they need. I'm going to repeat it. They need appropriate food, 
oxygen, water, temperature, pH, and light. So now let's talk about um, this proper environment that they need. Let's talk about it in detail. Let's start with food. <laughs> Microorganisms need nourishment. I'm not going to read the rest of this. This is the most important thing you need to know. They need more nourishment in order to survive. Oxygen. Now there's aerobic and anaerobic. Let's start with the aerobic. Look what it says. It says aerobic bacteria require oxygen for survival and for multiplication sufficient to cause disease. In order for them not only to survive, but to multiply and grow to cause disease, they need oxygen. So when you see aerobic, you need to be thinking of oxygen. They need oxygen to survive. Anaerobic bacteria thrive with little or no free oxygen. Let's talk about water. I used water as an example. Most organisms require water or moisture for survival. And guess what? Most of them survive when there is water that is not moving. It's just sitting there. That is a perfect medium for bacteria to grow, to grow, okay? A common spore forming uh, bacterium is C. diff, an organism that causes antibiotic induced diarrhea. What did I write on the side? Okay, so here on the side, I wrote wash hands in isolation. Yep, the patient has C. diff. You better make sure they're washing their hands. You're washing your hands. That patient's gonna be in isolation. Let's look at temperature. For temperature, look what it says. Cold temperatures tend to prevent growth and reproduction of bacteria. This is what's known as bacteriostasis. You need to know the difference between bacterial stasis and bactericidal, okay? So bacterial, something that's bacteriostatic or bacteriostasis, that prevents the growth and reproduction of bacteria. A temperature or chemical that destroys bacteria is bactericidal. So if it kills bacteria, it's going to be bactericidal. But if it just prevents the growth or reproduction, that's going to be bacteriostatic, okay? Make sure you know the difference between the two. Let's talk about pH. Bacteria in particular thrive in urine with an alkaline pH. The lower the pH, the more acidic it is, and the higher the pH, the more basic or alkaline. So it's telling you that bacteria thrive in urine with a more alkaline pH. And that makes sense. That's why when you're teaching patients, you know, things to do to prevent um, urinary tract infections, you're going to tell them to drink lots of water because you want to flush the bladder. You're going to tell them to drink um, acidic drinks such as orange juice, um, um, cranberry juice. Why? Because that acidic environment in the bladder is not an environment where bacteria is likely to grow. Bacteria doesn't thrive well in acidic environments. That's number one. And number two, let me tell you what the acidic, what the acidic environment does for the bladder. When the bladder is more acidic, the urine in the bladder is more acidic, what happens is the pathogens, microorganisms can't stick to the bladder wall the way it used to. And so what happens is if it's not sticking, it's right there in the urine. When the person urinates, it gets flushed out. It doesn't have a chance to sit there in the bladder and grow. And so that is important for you to know as well. Let's look at light. Microorganisms thrive in dark environments such as those under dressings and within body cavities. Let's move on to portal of exit. Portals of exit include sites such as blood, skin and mucous membranes, respiratory tract, genital urinary tract, gastrointestinal tract, and transplacental, that's the mother to fetal, mother to fetus, okay? Those are all the portal of exits for the pathogens. So let's go into detail with all of these portal of exits. Let's start with the skin and mucous membranes. It says the skin and mucus, uh, the skin is considered a portal of exit because, and I underlined this, look at this, any break in the integrity of skin and mucous membranes allows pathogens to exit the body. Guys, your skin is your first line of defense against pathogens, right? But that skin, um, th there being a break in that integrity is a perfect way for the pathogen to leave as well. Let's keep going. Respiratory tract. 
It says pathogens infect the respiratory tract, such as influenza, that's the flu. Influenza virus are released from the body when infected person, look at this, sneezes or coughs. So this pathogen was in the person's body and then they sneeze or cough and it exits the body through that sneeze or cough. They're really exiting the body through what? That respiratory tract. Let's keep going. Let's talk about the urinary tract. How does it exit through the urinary tract? Normally, urine is sterile. Your bladder is supposed to be a sterile environment. However, when a patient has a urinary tract infection, microorganisms exit during urination. Let's talk about the GI tract. So the mouth is one of the most bacterially contaminated sites in the human body, but most of the organisms are normal flora. This is the type of um, um, bacteria that is protective of the body. That's what normal flora is, okay? Organisms that are normal flora in one person can be pathogens in another. So something that can be normal flora in one person, another person, for example, who's immunocompromised, that can be an infectious agent for them. For example, organisms exit when a person expectorates saliva. In addition, gastrointestinal uh, portals of exit include emesis, bowel elimination, drainage of bile via surgical wounds, or drainage tubes. Reproductive tract, organisms such as gonorrhea and HIV, they exit through a man's urethromiatus or a woman's vaginal canal during sexual contact. So that's how pathogens can exit the body through the rep, um, reproductive tract. Let's talk about blood. The blood is normally a sterile body fluid. However, in cases of communicable diseases, such as hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, it becomes a reservoir for pathogens. So normally your blood is a sterile environment, but patients who are infected with these types of viruses, that same blood that was supposed to be a sterile environment has now become a reservoir, okay? Organisms exit from wounds, venipuncture sites, hematemesis, and bloody stools. So all of um, those means are ways that the microorganisms are exiting the body through the blood. All right, let's talk about modes of transmission. How are these pathogens getting, going from one host to another for a res reservoir to a host? Modes of transmission, I'm right here. So it says each disease has a specific mode of transmission. Many times you're able to do little about infectious agents or the, suscept or the susceptible host. But look at this, by practicing infection prevention and control techniques, such as number one, hand hygiene, you interrupt that mode of transmission. Again, washing your hands, hand hygiene is the number one way to disrupt the mode of transmission for infection. Take a look at this. I put a star next to it. You know, it's important to know the major route of transmission for pathogens identified in the healthcare setting is unwashed hands of the healthcare worker. Equipment used within the environment, such as a stethoscope, a blood pressure cuff, bedside commode, often becomes a source of transmission of pathogens. And that's why it's so important to not only wash your hands, but also clean off the equipment that is being used on these, on these patients. Portal of entry. Organisms enter the body through the same routes they use for exiting. So remember how we talked about exiting through the skin? Guess what, how they enter? through a break in the skin as well. So um, the same routes for entering the body is the same they use for exiting. Susceptible hosts, let's talk about this. Susceptibility to an infectious agent depends on the individual's degree of resistance to pathogens. In other words, look at what I wrote up here. I don't know if you can read my handwriting. I wrote resistance to infection. How susceptible a patient is, is how resistant to um, infection they are. You know, if uh, they're very susceptible, their resistance is very low. If their susceptibility is high, the resistance is low. If their susceptibility is low, the resistance is high. Let's keep going. The increased resistance is associated with frequent and sometimes inappropriate use of antibiotics over the years in all settings. 
I put a star next to it, guys. Increased resistance is associated uh, with frequent and sometimes inappropriate use of antibiotics over the years in all settings. So let me talk about this so you can understand what they're talking about in this specific passage. When they're saying increased resistance, they're talking about increased resistance to antibiotics, not to infection. OK, because if you take a look a couple lines above, they're talking about antibiotics. So the increased um, resistance that the patient has to antibiotics, which means if you give that patient antibiotics, their body's resistant to it. Those antibiotics are ineffective. It's not working. Very often, the reason that this has happened is because of inappropriate use of antibiotics. They've been taking antibiotics since they were a little kid. Their body's gotten used to every single antibiotic known to mankind. So now that they're really sick, and they need that antibiotic to kill the bacteria, their body is resistant to that antibiotic, okay? And down here, I wrote, if you have an increased resistance to infection, your susceptibility to infection is decreased. And if you have a decreased resistance to infection, your, suscept your susceptibility to infection is increased. Make sure you guys understand that concept. One last thing I want to uh, show you before we end this video. And I have to end it soon because I have a class I have to go teach very shortly. I want you guys to take a look at this table. It is common pathogens and uh, some infections or diseases that they produce. The ones that I put a star next to, that I put a star next to, Make sure you know it. These have been seen on NCLEX. If you're currently taking fundamentals of nursing, you're going to see this on your exam somewhere. Don't say I didn't warn you. If I put a star next to it or I put NCLEX, that means you need to know it. So here's the list. Make sure you know about uh, e. coli and the major infection or disease is the gastroenteritis um, can cause UTI, staph, um, wound infection, pneumonia, food poisoning, cellulitis. Strep, sore throat, that's your strep throat, rheumatic fever, scarlet fever, impetigo, wound infections. Tuberculosis, mycobacterium tuberculosis, that's what causes tuberculosis. And then your, your hepatitis viruses, your hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. Make sure you know them. Don't say I didn't warn you. And guys, that is the end of this video for part one. Part two, I'm going to go into the infectious process. I just can't do it now. I have a class that I'm about to be late for, so I have to get going. But please, in the comment section, let me know what you thought about this video. Let me know if you look forward to seeing a part two, three, four, or if there's anything else that you'd like to see me cover in the future. I know I've been seeing your comments and you've been asking for more lectures, so I'm going to try to produce more lecture types. Um, also, please don't forget, if you go to my website, Nexus Nursing Institute, you can check out uh, the resources I have available besides the audio lessons you can book in NCLEX, Next Generation NCLEX Review, or a consultation session, or a private tutoring session with me. I book very quickly. Like the minute I open up my calendar, my appointments, they, I mean, they take them up very quickly. So if you don't see anything, just keep checking. Don't forget to check out my other social media platforms, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, if you would like to see me go over different nursing uh, topics almost on a daily basis. Again, guys, the website is nexusnursinginstitute.com. Thank you so much for watching this video. You guys will catch me on the next video.